the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, you should look upon us as ministers of Christ, as trustees of the secrets of God. And it is a prime requisite in a trustee that he should prove worthy of his trust. But as a matter of fact, it matters very little to me what you or any man thinks of me. I don't even value my opinion of myself, for I might be quite ignorant of any fault in myself, but that doesn't justify me before God. My only true judge is God himself. The moral of this is that we should make no hasty or premature judgments. One of the disclosures which have pressed in upon us during this week as we have thought about the values by which men live in our success and security is generally the way of conformity. For we live in a world which tends to reward and accept the conformists and to penalize and ostracize the nonconformists. At the present time, conformists are being given a bad time in many quarters. They're the brunt of jokes. They are often the object of contempt. Pete Seeger's jibes about the conformists are both delightful and accurate. His, his song describes all those suburbanites living in boxes, boxes all the same, all made out of ticky-tacky. I suppose just like the people living in them, they too are made of ticky-tacky, and their, their children go to the university, and they all come out the same. And the children get married and go to live in boxes, pretty boxes. And it's delightful also to hear the song about the man with the company outlook who follows the company's line, dresses as the company wants him to dress, fills the role which the company has for him to fill, serene in the security which the company is able to provide. If he's asked for ideas and criticism, he says just enough to appear alert and provocative, but not so much that he gets in trouble. And he sings about the pin he will get after 25 years, which he says is the only thing they'll ever pin on him. Well, the humor is poignant because it's so pertinent. The vast majority of men are conformists. And for most of them, life is correspondingly shallow. In this land of the free, we cherish our heritage, our spirit of independence. But most of us are caught in a pattern of slavish imitation in which there is precious little exercise of independent choice. We are seldom against the stream. Usually, we drift with the tide. We allow ourselves to be brainwashed by the advertising agencies and the mass media. We allow the course which leads to our acceptance and our security to dominate us. And we're content to make the most of things as they are and shrink from the risk of making a revolution. It may be, as Dr. Grulio stressed yesterday, that the real challenge facing our generation is that of realizing the full meaning of human dignity. Part of what is involved in recognizing the dignity of man is the achievement of a way of life which guarantees the independence and autonomy of human personalities. It's in terms of their recognition of the right of people to be individuals that the respective societies of our times will eventually be judged. Independence is what is demanded for the fulfillment of human personality and for the realization of life's possibilities. 
Now, in every age, the young have to take steps to protect themselves from the dominance of their elders and to assert their independence, their independence of the older generation. The clash of generations is inevitable. It's a clash which may be less cataclysmic and severe if there are strong ties of love and understanding between old and young, but the clash has to take place in order for the younger generation to come into its own. In our time, the result of the clash of generations is nonconformity doubly compounded. The younger generation refuses to conform to the older generation, and that's a natural enough impulse. But when the dominant characteristic of the older generation is its conformity, then conformity itself becomes the arch enemy of the young. So the heightened hostility towards conformity, which is to be observed among young people today, is more than an adolescent revolt against the manners and styles of their elders. It's a, it's a, it's a renunciation of, of conformity itself. Of course, the youth is not himself free from pressures to conform within the scope of his own society. He experiences a certain pressure from his, peer, from his own peers to conform in nonconformity. Hence, the present nonconformism is not necessarily proof of a greater exercise of independent judgment. Even a superficial examination discloses that there's a great deal of thoughtless imitation within the cult of nonconformity. But the young independents are in many ways a refreshing lot. Still, their way of life, no less than that of the conformists, must ultimately be scrutinized by reference to a Christian standard. Christianity stresses individuality. It demands independence. It regards the individual personality as of infinite worth, and it makes the individual's own free choice infinitely decisive. In God's scale of values, civilization is not an ultimate good. Institutional success is not a final aim. Historical progress is not a basic concern. What is of ultimate worth is the individual soul for whose good all other things are to be regarded as means. Neither God nor the Christian church has any interest in mere conformity. On the contrary, the gospel is addressed to the individual as a thinking and choosing person. Faith is not transferable, and spiritual decisions cannot be made by proxy. In matters of the spirit, a man stands before God always alone. Christianity, therefore, insists that you must be an individual and that you must exercise your independence. You must master the art of nonconformity and protect your own independence against the temptation to imitate someone else. But there's a Christian kind of nonconformity which is to be contrasted with a non-Christian nonconformity. If your nonconformity is to be Christian, it may not be may be at the expense of others. It may not cause injury to another. And it may not be ostentatious, pretentious, and vain. Our text has always aroused a great awe in me. It's the saying of a man who achieved the height of nonconformity. And I tremble to think that it is a kind of, uh, of nonconformity, a quality of nonconformity, which I too am expected to attain. It takes a considerable nerve to say, I, I don't care what you or any man thinks of me. Indeed, were I to say that in my present state, 
I would most certainly be guilty of the worst of presumptuous sins. There are two very different attitudes out of which a man might say, it doesn't matter to me what people think. On the one hand, there's the attitude of a man who is bent on getting something which he desires very badly, or on doing something even though it's socially prohibited. And when he says, I don't care what people think, his voice has a tone of defiance. But on the other hand, there's the attitude of the man whose experience has brought him into the painful awareness of the conflict between duty and interest, and whose very integrity has been the occasion of suffering. And when such a man says, I don't care what people think, his voice has a tone of resignation and of regret. It's in this latter spirit that Paul says, it matters very little to me what you or any man thinks of me. My only true judge is God himself. What finally matters to a conscientious man is only whether his action is acceptable with God. Whether or not men may approve is not of essential importance. The acceptance of men and the rewards which that acceptance brings with it are not what is finally important. It is only the word of the master that counts. Well done, good and faithful servant. Kant once said that morality is not properly the doctrine how, to be, how we should make ourselves happy, but how to become worthy of happiness. So the conscientious Christian is not concerned about obtaining the rewards of virtue, but about being virtuous in a manner which will merit God's reward. Exercise your liberty as God's son. You're free, and you are God's servant, not the servant of any man. You do not belong to any man or to any human institution. Christ has set you free. Only exercise your liberty in, in a manner which is part of your discipleship. The exercise of your nonconformity must be in conformity to the pattern of the Lord, whose name is love. Let considerateness control your nonconformity. Give no cause for offense unless it is Christ himself who is the offense that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. And never forget your solidarity with humanity. For as the poet says, no man is an island entire of itself, Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee.